It's 12 o'clock. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for attending today's webinar live from Peterborough, Ontario. We're about to introduce Phragmites today. It's the third in a series of eight based on our BMP booklets. My name is Amanda Warren. I'm the Outreach Liaison for the Alwood Ontario Invasive Plant Council. And I'm very pleased to be here uh, today to deliver the webinar. Um, before I did, some logistics. For those of you with headsets who are listening in, you shall set. For those of you on the phone, uh, listening uh, in on the phone, or if you're having technical difficulties, please call our toll-free number for the program. It's 1-855-797-9485. Uh, if you need an access code, the access code is 661-868. Four nine. We'll be on mute during the presentation and the answer period, so please type all of your questions into the question and answer box. Once we finish the presentation, I'll be reading your questions, and we'll have Janice, our panelist today, uh, answering them. I'm going to introduce our panelist, Janice Gilbert. Are you on the line, Janice? Janice is a wetland ecologist and also the co-founder, the co-chair and the founder of the Ontario Phragmites Working Group. Uh, you've probably seen her before in a lot of her presentations. She's everywhere. Janice has been investigating Phragmites impacts and control methods with insensitive Great Lakes coastal habitat since 2007. And she's the lead author on over 40 Phragmites related reports and presentations. And she provides extensive advice relating to fray control to provincial parks and municipalities, to cottages, associations, and individuals. Um, she's researching and assessing wetland ecosystems for the last 19 years. Stay with us, Janice. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. I am going to go ahead and mute you now. Or you? I'm not going to mute you. You, you mute us, or uh, mute yourself, I should say, and. Uh, if there's anything glaring uh, that I misinterpret, uh, say falsely, anything that needs to be updated, you can go ahead and do that at the end of the presentation before we answer any questions. So the presentation will be approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and we'll use the rest of the hour for questions and discussion. I also say that our webinars are being recorded. They'll be posted on our website so that you'll be able to um, look at them again, uh, read the slides. We put a lot of text in some of the slides that's on purpose so that uh, when we, you go ahead and, and look at the slides afterwards, that they'll be very clear and, and easily understood. They're going to be available on our website. Tara is the best management practices for introduced Phragmites, the European Common Read. Naming is not always consistent, so it's thing that we're going to focus on in our updated BMP, but for this webinar and for our document, we're going to be refra uh, referring to it as FRAG or FRAGMITE. The webinar was created in partnership with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and uh, Forestry at the Invasive Species Center. Uh, it is the, and I'm the supporting action of the Ontario Invasive Species Strategy Plan. They've been developed from our best management practices documents to provide information for you and landowners for giving advice and, and the best, really not the only management Practices, but the best that we can come up with um, through uh, the best known information and environmentally safe control practices available at the time. If you uh, haven't been here before, we've had already two Phragmites webinars this year. They've been wonderful. And we're excited to have a few more later on this year. So please join us for those if you can. And if you can't, just uh, check on our website and you can watch them later. If you're available, if you can do it, 
Uh, share the information with anybody who might be interested. Let them know that these webinars are coming up. Social media is a powerful thing, and and uh, knowledge is always good to pass on. A little bit now. The Air Invasive Plant Council was founded in 2007. Representatives from everywhere, from industry, from, from First Nations, governments, uh, profit and non-governmental organizations and academia, as well as private citizens and just about anybody who wants to get involved, uh, horticultural societies and, and growers. So it's really a fantastic body of representatives that can provide information um, from top to bottom up. Um, the council was um, made in, to coordinate the provincial efforts. Uh, so they coordinated effort uh, in response to the growing threat of invasive species. Applications are available online and free of charge. And exciting that's coming up, uh, we've got a new BMP for Frank Mighty's. Um, specifically for road management for for BMP road, and we also have a side prioritization site prioritization tool coming up. So those will be coming down pipe in a couple of uh, weeks or months. So look at them on our website. Any resources that you require, or information that you may need, just let us know. This workshop is to provide land managers, and really anybody that needs or wants to know what they need to create a management plan for the effect of control. Mindies, invasive Phragmites. So we're going to cover everything from the background, a little bit of a description, uh, distribution, how we'll be able to identify these, what alikes look like, and, and how to tell them apart. The biology, the life cycle, uh, pathways of spread, how that impacts, uh, and we'll get into the best management practices and control measures. As we'll talk a little bit about some other resources and reporting tools that you can use for these and of the native and invasive plants. We'll talk a little bit about these wonderful plants called Phragmites australis, the European Comrade. So you'll forgive me, I, uh, I'm not used to talking to myself in a room. I don't know if anybody's having any trouble understanding uh, or need some clarification afterwards. Please don't hesitate to, to uh, type answer box. Phragmites are in Eurasia. Uh, introduced uh, to Atlantic coasts of the United States and Canada in the 1800s. We're assuming there's a few different theories here, but the contaminant in, a, in packing material is one of those. It's really, at the moment, unimportant how it got here. The fact that it got here and has been spreading across the uh, eastern North America uh, rapidly it has, uh, has really begun to worry a lot of people. It was recorded in southwestern Nova Scotia in 1910. Nine. It was in southern Nova Scotia along the St. Lawrence and Quebec City. And it all. And since then, it's been recorded in southwestern Ontario since the 1950s, increasing rapidly. Um, I, myself, I left Canada in 2005 uh, for about 10 years' time. And when I left Canada, uh, these things weren't on my radar at all. And, and I was quite involved in invasive species. When I got back in 2014, I couldn't keep my eyes off of them. I thought, A, they are very interesting plants. They're, they're pretty. Uh, nobody can say anything against that. But uh, they were everywhere. It astounded me. And I got interested again in that. It's interesting enough. It's during the term, and it's frame, which means fence or hedge or screen. It's been used. For a lot of different things, including phytoremediation, uh, for thatched roofs, for instruments, for basket weaving, and even as fishing poles. Because uh, 
listed by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada 2005 as Canada's worst invasive species, and we'll get to why in a couple of minutes. It is an invasive plant. It's perennial. It's a, it's a wetland grass. It's in the family of Poaceae, or Poaceae, depending on how you like to say it. But this plant is, although you can see a lot of it above ground, most of it is, in fact, below ground. 80% of it, rhizomes and roots. It's growing to a specific spot through seeds and to seed spreads. Uh, it grows and expands rapidly underground, making it very, very difficult to control. It has a variety of habitat, um, high level of water, low level of water, pH. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, and it releases larger than usual amounts of a compound called gallotannins, which uh, initially are but the limes produced by microbes in the, in the root zone of the soils by the roots themselves. So some native wetland plants convert them to something called gallic acid. Gallic acid actually destroys the in structural integrity of the plant roots. It breaks down the tubulin protein. So that helps the, the keep good. Uh, the gallic acid will destroy that. And the gallic acid can also be degraded by UV light. Uh, into something called meso mesotic acid. I'm not very good at pronouncing that, sorry. Which is also toxic. So in essence, this allelopathic uh, property of uh, fragmentase is poisoning uh, the soil around it with different toxins so that it outcompetes in, uh, the other native um, plants and doesn't allow them to grow. This helps them to aggressively invade the coastal wetlands and the beaches and especially disturbed ecosystems. Interesting is that there was a lot of discussion a few years ago about whether this Phragmites australis is uh, uh, the same uh, species as the Americanus, which is our native plant here, which is not very invasive. It it's, uh, doesn't grow as densely, it's not as tall. Um, and it was really thought to be the same species until about the 1980s. In fact, not. In North America, this Phragmites, the invasive Phragmites, has been found in all 48 states uh, and all provinces. The territory is accepted. Um, and really, it scatters across southern Ontario and increases dramatically. This map that you see by Ed Matt, it's, uh, it's a voluntary map system, mapping system. People call in and report uh, through the internet and our app. Um, uh, so the Frank Mighty. So this is a voluntary thing. It's, it's not complete, but you can get an idea of the of spread of these uh, this plant and the hot spots are, especially in southern Ontario. Uh, you can see it, it does follow um, roadways quite well. Um, it has been identified and, and seen in the Northwest Territories, but not in a bit, not the continent yet. By 1990, much more frequent in the St. Lawrence River Valley in southwestern Ontario, and it extended you know, westward into eastern Ontario, and by 2010, it had spread to Ontario and southern Quebec. But it's also been spreading into Western Canada. So it's appeared in Northern Ontario, Northwestern Ontario, Southern Manitoba, the interior of Southern British Columbia. And the rate at which it's spreading is increasing. Within a decade or two, based on the extent of the appropriate hardiness zone currently occupied, it is expected to become abundant in the prairie provinces and across most of Southern Canada. So this is a big problem, not just in Ontario. A little bit of a more interesting map. Um, just for the native Phragmites, non-native uh, Phragmites, uh, and the distribution across specifically the Great Lakes region. You can see how it being especially along the Great Lakes and waterways. Now, to identify this, as I 
said before, it does get stuck a little bit with the native phragmites. So it's difficult to tell apart. The invasive phragmites can grow very, very, very tall, over six meters. Um, and they, they form very, very dense monocultures, which can be up to 100% phragmites. Um, and that's different from the native species, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We've got a beige or tan rigid stem. It's a little bit different early on in its growth stages. But uh, an adult or a mature plant will have a uh, beige or tan stem. Uh, the inner notes are red. Uh, the stem is, is rough and dull. It's got, got a dull texture. Uh, and the green. Uh, they hold themselves about 45 degrees from the stem. Interesting and very key ID feature is that unlike the native varieties species, the leaf sheaths are very difficult to remove. They key as well, and this is something that I've noticed when I first got back, are the, are the seed heads. They're gorgeous, uh, full, dense seed heads, very large. Um, and, uh, a little bit different from the natives. Uh, the natives are a little bit sparser, and we'll talk about that in a second. Well, at the stages of establishment, these plants can have very similar morphological characteristics. If you're in any doubt, it's important just refer to those documents, either in our BMP of pictures, uh, but a lot of reference documents on the net or our website. So take a look at those if you're uh, in any doubt. The fact they can grow to six meters doesn't mean that they always do. So that's not always a, uh, a reliable ID method. IDs is a bit shorter. It's typically less than four meters in height. Um, sparser stands. Uh, there's other native uh, and, and non-native species that grow uh, throughout the stand. Um, they have flexible stems, which are reddish brown, and uh, under under the leaf sheath, and they're smooth and shiny as opposed to that rough and, and dull invasive phragmites. The hairs on the surface of the leaf sheath, uh, there are hairs, sorry, on the on the surface of the leaf sheath, and they the leaves fall off easily. And unlike the 45 degree angle, the yellow green leaves of the native Phragmites uh, have a 30 degree angle from the stem. And again, like I said, and you can see on the left hand side of, of the screen the picture of the um, difference between the heads of the uh, native Phragmite, which is on the bottom, and the native Phragmite on the top. Big difference. Um, Is also just a little bit different. The flower time for native Phragmites is about early, let's say July, August, whereas the native invasive, sorry, the invasive Phragmites, uh, flower time is about uh, August to September. This is a wonderful pic from Rondo Provincial Park of native Phragmites stands. You can see that there are other grasses and other plants growing interstitially. Now the gloom, uh, this is an important uh, ID characteristic as well. The gloom is similar to a bract, and it's, uh, it's a modified or specialized leaf structure associated with the spike with a small spike up from the floor. So you have the difference between the low blooms of the native and introduced or invasive phragmites and uh, the upper gloom. They're different, one's longer than the other. As a key ID feature, if you're in the field and you need uh, uh, you need some more proof whether it's break mighties or not. Analogy and life cycle of break mighties is very important, especially when it comes to control efforts. 
follow the timelines listed in the uh, in the slides. But of course, timing will be very site specific. Jane, the plan is dormant from uh, November to March. So, uh, the chin takes place primary vegetative period for this species, and growth is from May to September, where the plant develops an extensive root system. Uh, but it'll vary for different parts of Ontario and different growing zones, so it'll produce different results. This is a guideline. Place, like I just said, about August to September. And very important translocation of the nutrients. So bring those nutrients down into the root system. Uh, it happens about September to October. And this is important for the translocation, not just the nutrients, but herbicides as well when we get to the treatment section. This is a factor of when to treat with herbicides. Produce via seeds, but it spreads very quickly uh, through underground rhizomes and above ground stolons. It causes a growth of exponential proportions. Um, rhizomes can grow horizontally several meters per year, and the vertical plants up to four centimeters a day. And uh, they do produce with about 2,000 seeds per head per, per year, per growing season. As you can see, the Phrygmites spread to new areas predominantly with the seeds dispersal. With the area through rhizomes and stolons. Uh, pictures here provided by uh, Janice, but quickly and more densely, um, uh, species. Stolons are stems that are connected to the parent plant so that they grow along the soil surface and can form these roots and shoots. Uh, but those are the ones that grow underground. So connected to the parent plant, but they're capable of growing shoots and roots, and and they spread through an area that way. The stolons can be transported through natural pathways such as wind and water and animal movement. Uh, with wind, it's been calculated that they can disperse just through alone by ten kilometers. So picked up. Through, through through pets and mud on tires and boots and and equipment and kids in new areas. So this is where it's very very important uh, that we clean our equipment. And I'd like to plug another document that we have here at the OIPC. It's called the Clean Equipment Protocol, um, and uh, that is also available free of charge. One of the most important vectors. Any kind of equipment movement, especially if you are treating an area um, and you don't clean your equipment with your human vehicles, uh, you're going to spread it. It's important to clean that equipment. Roads have, have a huge connectivity. And, uh, one of, and you can see it if you're driving down the road, how easily these things spread from, from just down through the road and very quickly. So control the spread. We can control the Phragmites to a degree. And impacts a little bit now. It's found in wetlands, but it's also found in roadside ditches and lake shores and wet fields. It can really grow in a lot of different places, from brackish to fresh water, from pHs from 4.8 to 8.2. Uh, it can grow in standing water from one meter below to one meter above. And it thrives, really thrives in disturbed the by diversity biodiversity are, are huge um, one of those things where if we don't control it now we're going to have a very large problem later on if we don't already the biodiversity and species richness is a huge problem this aggressively outgrows and outcompetes the native species for water and for nutrients. And like I said before, the the, the, the toxins from the roots really impede the growth of, of the neighboring plants. Um, they grow together in these thick stands that uh, reduces light and available uh, growing uh, soil for competition as well. So, uh, 
uh, it's really it's an out competing plan. It out competes everything and takes over. Um, it's not the best habitat for most species. The tough and rigid stocks and the more flexible new species uh, have an impact on native wildlife, uh, food source, but also as shelter. One uh, and and worrying problem in, in Ontario is what this is doing for our species at risk. About five percent of this in Ontario. We have to start thinking about what we're going to do about this plant, and that's why we're here today. And hydrology. Invasive phragmites have a very high metabolic rate and leads to changes in the water cycle of the systems within the ecosystem. Um, they have the ability to lower water levels and water table levels, and the water is transpired from very, very deep in the ground because the roots can, can reach quite deeply into the ground, table, and can transpire at a rate than it would in native vegetation. So it's causing a depletion of the water table as well. And because it lower water levels in small and, and isolated wetlands, there are some amphibians that require that those wetlands um, for their life cycles to complete their life cycles. This can affect drainage and sediment deposits, rapid growth, slow decomposition. Sorry, uh, um, impacts on agriculture, economy, society. It is a shame that a lot of times people don't start caring until it affects their pocketbook or their work. Um, the cost of, of controlling Phragmites, but also the cost of, of the impacts of Phragmites is quite large. Um, a few weeks ago uh, by Convey, and he was talking about uh, colonization and removal of Phragmites and treatment of Phragmites in ditches and roadsides and the impact it has on uh, just uh, drainage ditches alongside the road, but also in farmer and fields, and the blockages that it may cause. Pragmites can uproot artificial drainage tiles. They can form dense mass of vegetation in streams and ponds used for drinking water by the livestock. And in the U.S., uh, over a five-year period, owners and land managers uh, spent $4.6 million dollars Restoring habitat that is impacted by frag. And you can see a few of the costs that we've estimated here based on some of the experiences our, our contributors have had. Interestingly enough, um, the dead stocks can be a fire risk and uh, difficult to walk through. So it does impact recreation as well and property values. A big problem is that it obscures road intersections and uh, bikeways. There are accidents in, in conservation areas um, where Phragmites were growing uh, at an intersection of trails and bikers have been crashing into each other. Now, get into the best management practices, and this is where uh, Janice will be able to answer a lot of interesting questions that you have been posting. Um, We'll just go over the generals here, the base. What's important is that when you're going to put together a management plan, that you use the integrated approach. I um, refers to the practice of preventing or reducing damages by using the available information, along with a variety of ecologically and economically sustainable approaches and control methods. Um, and this is going to be based on a lot of factors. The, the life cycle biology of the plant. When, it is, when is it most susceptible to the treatment that you'd like to, to form? What time of year, for instance, that translocated kind of, of nutrients is a factor in, in herbicide effectiveness as well. So the time of the year is very important. The location of the plants. Is it near um, water body or not? Um, can, and therefore, can herbicides be used? Uh, the presence of other sensitive species, 
Um, if there are species nesting in the plant, then should we be mowing or cutting? These are all questions that need to be asked. Besides the infestation is going to um, um, give you an idea of what's actually feasible as far as control methods go and the skill level of the user. Established, that's the time that the control uh, is cheapest and most effective. Um, you can want to strategy with the considerations that are listed here, one to four. Um, remove the outlying populations first um, to prevent further spread. You want to concentrate on the high priority areas. These are the areas that either uh, have sensitive ecosystems um, that are favored or, or popular, that are the most productive or most worrisome, maybe they're the ones that are most impacted. You focus a amount of time each year to control, um, because this is a yearly ongoing thing, um, and it's best to join with a large body of people that you can coordinate, i.e. neighbors, land managers. And the regeneration of the native plants, that helps to outcompete or to um, to reestablish a native uh, flora, but you may require some restoration and seeding. That's something that we need to think about too when coming up with an integrated pest management plan for Phragmites. The first step is also always, no matter if you're talking about Phragmites or any other species, is you want to. Uh, an inventory of the plants that are there. You can see these all year round. It's winter. You can see them on the side of the road, the dead stands uh, that stay there all year round. Is it going to find them in April and May, the primary vegetative growth stages in May to September, the flowering in August to September? Um, my early sign of Phragmites. That's going to enable you to, to understand big that stand is and, and how many uh, um, acres or hectares are, are impacted. And if you it correctly and you know that it is an invasive frame that is uh, impacting that particular piece of land, um, take inventory and your pest management plan. We're going to the specific timing of a lot of the methods. But the other questions you want to be asking about time is when you have the least amount of impact on things that want impacted, like the non target species, uh, the, the sensitive species, but really any species that are native that you want nesting or feeding uh, in that area. Um, when is the control effort going to have the least impact on recreational use and therefore tourism and economic factors? Um, is it going to have the least amount of impact on birds and wildlife that might have a nest there? Um, we have uh, the control efforts done. Is your goal to minimize seeding or maximize effectivity of, of herbicides? That's something we're going to talk about and that needs to be thought about. And at what life stage um, do we expect? Incredibly important. This is something that I cannot impress enough. Follow the regulations, including the Pesticide Act and the Ontario Regulations 6309. Those have to be followed. For more information, check the government websites. Uh, you don't have all the information you need in the BMP. Not going to go through all of the points here, um, but please read them carefully if you really are interested in a pesticide program. If you target a uh, of the invasive Phragmites cell or with herbicide, it's going to be ineffective. You really have to treat everything in that cell or nothing. Um, you're going to waste funds. You're going to waste herbicide. After Important to know about Phragmites is that the efficacy or the effectiveness of spraying leaf surface is available. When the leaves are open and available to, to absorb uh, the spray, and that's usually when the plant is about 1 to 1.5 meters in height, but again, it's site specific and plant specific. Make sure that you use the right herbicide. 
Uh, we've we've mentioned a couple of them here, the Roundup Weather Max and Vision Max. They're registered for Phragmites Control. They're not the only ones you want to check um, with the registration website. Uh, these are only available and to be used when surface water is not present, not near open water. Make sure that you stick to a method of application for chemicals. So we're focusing on we're on herbicides because it really is the, the number one uh, option at the moment for controlling freight mites. It is the most effective and cost of this method, um, but it's going to be used for the most part in conjunction with other methods, and it can't be used over water, and it's not specific. It means that it, it affects not just the native, uh, the, the invasive species, but non-native or the native species as well. There's schools of thought three uh, spraying. That's when you have this backpack, and, and a person licensed to do so can spray uh, in the field using the backpack and a spray hose. Or there are booms mounted on on vehicles, ATVs, uh, and there's wicking. Those are for small stands, and those are that's when you apply the pets to individual plants. Um, don't spray them or treat them if the plants are wet with dew or rain, and if the temperatures are too cold or too hot. This is all information that's available on the product label, um, but this, the increased or, or decreased temperature will reduce the absorption of the herbicide. Again, we're responsible for when you project a control project for all of the laws, including the municipal laws, the bylaws, the provincial laws, the federal legislation. Before you start any kind of a program, you're going to need some permits. And there may be other requirements that are necessary for your control program, depending on the work involved in the location. If your project meets the criteria for the natural resources exception, then you contact the MNRF office and obtain a, an application for a letter of opinion. Partnership. If you have conservation authority, uh, you may not require that letter. So these are things you need to think about before. Um, thinking about a patrol program. Some other key considerations with chemical control um, is the disposal of the, the chemical, the transport of the chemical that's all regulated. Take at that before you get started. Um, there are exceptions under the Pesticide Act for chemical control on your property. Um, and again, if any of your project falls under any of these exceptions, you want to make sure that you contact the correct authorities. Um, and any pesticide application must be done by a licensed exterminator or you have to hold a certificate yourself. This can't be done by homeowners that don't have a certificate. The next method of control that we're going to just briefly go over is hand removal or digging. And this is a little bit more uh, labor intensive. Uh, it could be uh, good for small, isolated stands of, of plants, generally less than two years old. They're easier to pull up, and the roots haven't grown to such a degree that they're just impossible to, to, to pull out. Um, you can also use straight-edge shovels to, to cut the stems below the sediment surface, but it noted you have to get the rhizomes out. You have to get the, the stems out, uh, all pieces of the roots out, or else they'll just regrow. This is a method for sandy soils, and uh, we've got a great set of pictures from a woman uh, named Lynn Short who had a program, a Wimblewood Beach Phragmites Removal Project. They had good success um, after identifying the Phragmites. Uh, they used a, a flat edge shovel. They cut below the surface and just lifted that up. They didn't remove the thing as a whole and disturb the entire ecosystem or uh, the soil around the sand uh, um, surrounded fragments. It left the soil undisturbed, but they could just lift it and tip the, the edge of the shovel and pull out the fragmites that were there. It is intensive, but they, and they've got great leg muscles. So that's, that's a wonderful program. This is the same ecosystem looked for and after treatment. You can see on the left are the befores, on the right are the afters. Very effective 
um, but again, labor intensive and really uh, good when you don't. More adding is also an option. Um, what's great about these options is that they are low cost, um, but they won't kill the root systems. This is something that has to be ongoing. You have to keep mowing, keep cutting, or the, the root systems will just simply reestablish. So it's an ongoing thing. Um, cut ends after they have viable, uh, developed a viable seed is also kind of a factor that you have to think about um, that when you cut. And the dimensional riding mowers, you have to start cutting in spring uh, before the height really gets too too big to be able to cut with them. Um, you need to frequently cut throughout the growing season. These things grow qu quickly. More intensive. Um, but it can't be used as a standalone method if you want to eradicate a population. The problem is that it does really um, curtail the stands because it, 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 it down on, on density and increases plant rigor or it increases the plant rigor. It really exhausts some of the uh, the plant stores in the roots. It removes the dead and the standing stock so that you can uh, allow the native growth um, to come through. And also, if you're looking at herbicide treatment after cutting, settle the plants, the new plants to grow so that you can treat them with herbicide. And again, once you cut it, then you can identify how much regrowth you have uh, to evaluate the success of your program. Again. Best these mechanical uh, control methods. Best to use them in uh, combination with uh, an herbicide treatment. But pre, uh, if you're going to treat and then mow, then you're going to want to uh, winter if at all possible. Because as soon as spring comes, you're going to have some some nesting wildlife to worry about. You want to mow a minimum of four weeks prior to herbicide application because. That you've got to allow the the plants to grow and produce leaves um, so that you can treat them with the herbicide. Post chemical, if you want to um, mow birds, you want to mow a minimum of uh, three weeks after herbicide treatment, so allowing that plant to really translocate, bring that herbicide down into the roots where it's going to kill it. But you're going to go between early fall and late spring to remove the dead after herbicide application, uh, and you really want to remove the cut material from the site to allow that sunlight to reach the soil so that new native plant genera uh, generations can grow. And, uh, as the rolling compressing method, this is where you will cut the post uh, chemical treatment, and it allows for effective, for instance, burning if you want to get to a prescribed burn. Uh, remove the dense biomass greatly. It enhances the native plant growth. Uh, and very similar to mowing, you want to conduct this a minimum of three weeks after herbicide application. And again, not a standalone method. A good method is that it is nonspecific. So you're just going to roll and affect the, the invasive Phragmites, but also the non uh, the plants as well, and anything nesting. Cutting is another interesting method that has been tried. It has a minimal effect on wildlife, but it's not always effective. And it has a large impact on the uh, soil flora and also uh, non-specific, which means it affects the native plants as well. So uh, you cover the area with a tarp, uh, and that'll cook the root system. It works best if you have a population that's in direct sunlight. So that temperature has to really increase under the tarp. And uh, there is that some of these these, these um, can grow right through uh, the tarp. Um, so you have to monitor it regularly. Other option, uh, minimal effect on wildlife, but again, uh, it can be used in areas where water levels can be controlled, it should be controlled, and it's nonspecific. Uh, if there's no water, then cut the stalks as close to the sediment as possible. Remove all the cut uh, material so that it doesn't spread down stream. And you need to make sure that the rhizomes underwater, uh, uh, because 
if they can obtain oxygen um, from the parts of the plant that are above uh, water level. Um, Prescurning is another option. I'm trying to get through these. Uh, I see that our time is running out for questions, so I want to get through these as quickly as possible so that we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm going pretty quickly. Do not hesitate to go back and read these with more information or grab our BMP. Prescurning it promotes uh, the remove excess biomass, the old stuff. Get rid of the old stuff and allow the new stuff to grow. Um, best in combination with an herbicide treatment. Uh, again, it should be done a minimum of three weeks after herbicide treatment. So you make sure that the translocation of the herbicide to the roots is complete. And it has to be done by trained individuals. Do not try this at home. Uh, disposal is a very important topic. Depending on the amount of plant material you have, um, disposal could be an issue. Only if you have a dry area, for instance, something that's covered in, in tarp and that's not uh, near a water body so that the plant material cannot be washed away, especially the seeds, and washed into new areas. Uh, you can place the smaller amounts of plant material in, in black bags, brown bags or black bags, and tied and in direct sunlight for at least seven days. I would say black instead of brown. Uh, it can be dried. It can be burned. It can be sent to the landfill. Seed viability is no longer there. You don't want to send viable seeds to the landfill. Now you're going to want to partner with your municipality to find out the best way to dispose of it. At the moment, there is no standalone biological option for for controlling invasive uh, phragmites. Um, there's a common reed midge uh, that has been um, being examined that acts uh, native phragmites um, and these options are being looked at but again not available as of yet and certainly not as a standalone option. Mission is important. Uh, once you get rid of an invasive species or any kind of control option the site will be disturbed. If you disturb the site the species or other invasive species are ones that usually come in and um, uh, to that site. So you're really wanting to look at and think about reseeding with a uh, seeding or disturbed uh, the disruption to a minimum. Think about ways that you can keep your disruption to a minimum and uh, and encourage you to plant growth at the same time. You know, no matter what plant you're dealing with, you want to prevent the spread. And there's a few ways of doing that. The first one is you can call our uh, invading species hotline um, or um, report it uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, I'll get to some details on the next slide. You want to watch it. You want to monitor it. If you see it, or detection, get rid of it as soon as you see it, or a report it. Stay if there's a trail, you want to stay on it, especially with ATVs and any kind of vehicle and pets. If you travel off the trail, you're going to be spreading phragmites um, and seeds and other non-natives. Uh, stop spread by using our clean equipment protocol or common sense and inspecting and cleaning and removing mud and seeds and plant parts from your vehicles and any kind of equipment that you may use, including shoes. Your soils, never plant native plants. Don't remove non-native plants from an uh, sorry, native plants from an area and plant them in your garden because this will disturb the soil and leave it vulnerable to invasive species. Always use native species in your garden because it's wild. And help track the spread of phragmites. Here's a hotline that you can call or use the EdMaps. Uh, we also have an app for EdMaps. This is a great way of not only reporting your invasive species, but also uh, finding out what's in your area and uh, and um, friends. 
acknowledge all of the contributors, the short list of the contributors to our BMP. There are so many more, and I'd especially like to um, thank our, our our panel today, Janice Gilbert, who is going to be taking some questions. I'm sure that that was so quick at the end. Uh, I think the most important thing. Let's uh, take some questions. <laughs> Jim, are you there? Yes, well, I am here. Wonderful. Do you have anything? Just as I'm, I'm going to get this uh, my program organized here. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add to that right at the beginning? Well, you did a, a great job covering a lot of ground there. Uh, so uh, kudos to you. I, I just want to clarify just a couple of uh, comments. Uh, as far, uh, as, as in terms of the herbicides that are available specifically for Phragmites control, mm -hmm. they are the only two that you mentioned. There aren't any others. Great. Okay. At the same time. Yes. And with regard to Lynn Short's uh, program, um, the intent there is, is not to disturb the rhizomes at all. Um, intent is just to remove the stalk below the sediment where it connects to the rhizomes to deprive the below ground structures of photosynthetic derived energy. Disturbance to the rhizomes the better because if you if you cut rhizomes it really stimulates the growth of nodes and they start to take off again as well. So just just to clarify that for folks if they're looking to, to use that method. Great. Okay, so now I'm going to I'm looking at the question and answer box. I'm just trying to find my, my screen. Maybe you can answer our first question and uh it's about the timing. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about uh, controlling uh, using pesticides late in the summer and the fall um, and cutting first when those seed heads have already been developed and may shed new seeds into the area. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, it's a, really, it's a really good point because uh, if you apply the herbicide too early in the season, it's really not as effective as waiting later. And the reason is because, as you mentioned, you want the herbicide to uh, shut off the below, uh, the below ground structures. And in order for that to be most effective, the plant is translocating the roots or the, the nutrients down to those roots and rhizomes, uh, particularly for, for winter storage. So it starts to do that into August. But by that time, the plant is, uh, you know, at peak height, and the seeds have developed. But what we're finding is, even with developed seed heads, if we spray it with herbicide in the fall, even in late fall, they don't seem to be very viable. Or I have yet to see them being viable at all after a spray. So uh, that may not be an issue. Uh, folks may want to cut it before they spray is to reduce the plant stature. Um, but again, if you, you want to uh, stop cutting early in the growing season, like July, to give it an, enough time to grow to a um, high enough stature so that the herbicide will be effective. So there's enough, enough leaf that's developed to intercept the spray. So it's really uh, site specific, and certainly in, in a lot of the uh, systems I work in, cutting is not uh, appropriate, particularly with using track machines to cut. Um, it's very disruptive, actually, and not required, basically. Wonderful. I think that that answered the question. Um, just looking through some other ones here. Question about partnerships. Can you expand on why a partnership with the uh, CAs may not require an opinion letter from MNRF versus a partnership with the MNRF? You would need an uh, opinion letter. Can you tell that at all? Oh, so if you have a partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, you also don't need a letter of opinion. Um, but those, uh, and, and certainly with, if you're working with the Conservation Authority, you don't either, and that's in the legislation. Outside of working with those two, two entities, if you're going to be using a herbicide, you do have to get the, the letter of opinion. And basically, it's just a, a check in the system to make sure that the person doing the herbicide application is doing it properly. Number one, it is taking into consideration species at risk or other other uh, um, really important uh, things that have to be uh, thought about before herb herbicide application. So basically, making sure the project is is 
well thought out and, and being uh, undertaken responsibly. Well, thank you so much. Um, one more question. I'm just looking. There's not a ton of questions. Um, I'm having a trouble finding them, to tell you the truth. Um, our new phragmite is very common. Uh, I'll let you Oh. Yeah, so native Phragmites is not that common, but it certainly is all along the Great Lakes and Lake, Lake uh, Erie, Lake Huron. Uh, you will find it interspersed amongst the, the coastal wetland systems. So um, certainly this is something that you, you want to be aware of, and I've actually seen it in roadside ditches as well. Uh, so um, being able to differentiate between our native and invasive it's really important in the wetland system, uh, particularly. Um, but yeah, it, it's not that common to plant. Great. Another question: In cases where it's at the water edge, three to five meters out from the edge, is cutting below water surface and pulling up rhizomes best? So I would recommend pulling up the rhizomes. Actually, what I um, what the cutting does again, it, it just cuts the stalk. And what the stalk is is it acts as a draw to get uh, oxygen diffusion down to the below ground structures. And so if you can cut the straws off, then the diffusion is significantly lower through the water column. And so eventually those rhizomes, which actually do have the capacity to store oxygen in them as well, uh, eventually they do run out of oxygen. That's the to try and drown. So if water levels can stay uh, relatively uh, deep for extended periods of time, several weeks actually, um, you may be able to make that work. Um, but the, the other thing uh, that's important, and you had mentioned this, is make sure you get those stalks out of the water because if they're laying, uh, if the stalks are laying in the water, they can actually re-sprout um, new shoots at, at the node as well. So it can be potentially spreading around if you just cut the stalks and leave them in the water. One, thank you. I think that answered that one. Uh, another question. Thanks for providing this info. What are your thoughts on manual digging, for example, control, resulting in, hopefully, removal of all underground mass as well as soil and filling in with new sand on a public beach where chemical treatment is not an option? Well, I mean, if that's, if that's your only option, that's extremely disruptive. If it's a public beach, so in other words, it's, it's, it's intended to be a quote-unquote Bahama beach. You don't want your native plants growing there, which is really quite unhealthy for our lake, by the way. But if, if that's the intent, if it's just strictly recreational, um, it's very destructive, but it has been done, and it requires a repeated – I've seen where people have taken tractors and – and, and uh, just carefully plowed up the, the, the sand to remove the, and you have to remove all of the, all of the rhizomes and roots that come to the surface. It can be done, uh, but again, I, I don't recommend it certainly for a lot of our, our natural areas along the coastline. It, it's very, very uh, disruptive uh, um, undertaking, and it's not ecologically friendly, that's for sure. But uh, the qualifier was it was it's a beach it's a recreational beach so maybe uh, I would suggest is just if you can uh, just if you have to do that just make sure that you're only taking a small portion of that that shoreline do that and leave the rest for natural re regeneration. Uh, I like that uh, last sentence that was good. Um, well, the whole thing was good. I'm just saying I like that last bit. Too. Um, so we have someone from the MTO, and they have numerous kilometers of fry growing on the roadside ditches, filled with open, sorry, often filled with water. What would be the best approach to this if spraying is not an option? Uh, before you answer that, I want to direct uh, this individual to uh, our website where Ken Vay did a presentation specifically on this. And he was seeing a, another method of uh, cutting and treating as, as he cut. Uh, but aside from, from that, what would you say the answer to that question is, Janice? Certainly the cutting and, and uh, herbicide application, you can't do that over water either, just so folks know that. That's not an option for wet ditches right now. What we need for the wet ditches is the proper herbicides that allow to control Phragmites responsibly in wet situations. And uh, fortunately, uh, the Mystery Natural Resources have uh, just submitted an emergency use permit 
to the Pesticide Management Regulatory Agency, our Federal Health Canada um, agency that looks after these things, and we'll see we'll see how that goes. That's for a very specific area in, in Ontario right now, but hopefully that will open um, the the doors for us to get chemicals uh, available more broadly. And for the ditches, I get it. I get, you know, if it's wet, what are your options? And basically they're very limited right now, but if there are stretches of ditches that dry out hot, on hot uh, summers, that's a great time to go deal with them. Um, uh, if, you can, if you can get rid of uh, this time of year, you can just get rid of the seed heads so they, they uh, they do have an opportunity to spread into other areas. That that would help. I know that adds to the expense, and it certainly doesn't help with uh, control, but certainly reduce the spread. The thing for the roads, I, I know there's a vast amount of uh, road sides that need to be controlled. If you could target these that are closest to streams or rivers or or wetlands first, that would greatly reduce the the the, um, the amount of work that's going to have to take place if the fragmentation spreads into those areas. So those would be, would be high priority, and certainly right now, for high priority roads, Northern Ontario. Get control of all through cottage country, Northern Ontario, and then and then uh, let's focus in, in certain areas in Southern Ontario. Absolutely, we've got a, a cheering bunch of OIPC uh, employees here. Happy to hear that. That's our opinion as well. Um, do you have a couple of minutes more, Dennis, that you can continue questions, or do we have to call it quits? I, I'm... Okay, well, I will take a few more questions because there are a few popping up. Uh, that answered another uh, person who was asking about the uh, working group update on herbicides over water. So that's great. Um, oh, yeah, I, sorry, I didn't. I didn't actually <laughs> complete that, that that part of the of the picture, which is incredibly important. Um, so the two uh, um, products that we really need if we're if we're going to do this this uh, work properly, and uh, one is a Mazepier. Based and one is glyphosate based, and and the reason I feel so strongly that we require both of those uh, herbicide uh, types is because um, Phragmites is such uh, a problematic plant to deal with. Uh, I, I'm concerned with it becoming resistant to just one potential potential chemical uh, is high, and also. So, uh, with a lot of work being done in, in the U United States over the past decade or so, using both uh, in combination has been extremely successful. So, um, we are fortunate that we do have our, our provincial government really engaged in this issue and helping to, to get these, these uh, tools here for us, and also that the chemical companies are extremely interested in helping us restore, or protect and restore our, our wetlands and, get, and help deal with this plant. Great. Thank you so much for filling that out. That's wonderful. Um, someone is asking if there's an emailing list that we can join to get alerts of new documents, BMPs, in case we miss the webinar advertising. Uh, we do have a, um, uh, a mailing list. So just to give me an email, shout, send me an email or give me a call. My email is amanda at oninvasives.ca. That's support for Ontario Invasives. .ca, uh, and we'll get you on that mailing list. Um, but you can certainly uh, also join the OIPC, and there's a mailing list and, and a newsletter for you there as well. Um, and also, sorry to interrupt, but there is an Ontario Fragmites Working Group uh, website, right. and, and it is, is under construction, but um, it, it is another um, avenue to go to to get some information and get potential contacts if you want to. Uh, talk to one of our members about anything specifically and get, you know, advice from them. You don't have to reinvent the wheel or uh, spend a lot of time getting uh, looking for information. Absolutely. Um, another question. If we advertise the hotline phone number, will callers be directed to local agencies for the issue once they have had their initial questions or answered through the hotline call? It's site and, and, and uh, theme specific. So when you call that hotline, there is a real person on the end, uh, and uh, she does her best to answer all calls and direct you to the appropriate authorities. I hope that helps. Any uh Anything to add, Janice? <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to say, uh, Elaine Ferrier, um, the, just up until just recently, she she is uh, looking after uh, social media 
And we do have a, a, a letter campaign that is posted right now uh, asking for the public support um, for the initiatives to get the proper herbicides to make them available. And so um, you, can, you can check that out as well if, if um, you're interested in helping support these initiatives. And, um, I also see with this question a recommendation for wet blade applications for overwater. Uh, again, that, that's not allowed. Neither is hand -wicked, by the way. Overwater is overwater, and uh, we don't have a product right now available for overwater use. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, what do you think the main delivery pathway for populations in roadside ditches is? What do that again? What do you think? is the delivery pathway for populations in roadside ditches. So how do they get there? Oh, I see. There's an excellent study out of Quebec, and they made a direct uh, between road construction and the spread of phragmites. So basically, it's the heavy equipment. Um, it goes into an infected site, doesn't work, and it gets put on a flatbed truck and moved to another area where it transports the, the plant part. And so uh, that, to me, is... And I, that's what I see going in northern Ontario as well. So it's the heavy equipment, movement of heavy equipment. It's a huge spread vector right there. Absolutely. Um, and with the, the wind dispersal as well. So once it gets established in a certain area, the more cells that are in an area, the more dispersal, and then the higher um, genetic um, diversity and the higher viability of seeds. So um, that's, that's also uh, a, a mode for, for spread. But basically it's the heavy equipment. Wonderful. We have a few individuals that are asking for more information, uh, and if you please email me. Uh, I don't have uh, direct access to your emails uh, necessarily. I'm going to write down the people that I see, but in case I miss anybody uh, who, are, who is requesting information from the MTO or from other organizations on controlling in ditches, uh, please email me again at uh, amanda at oninvasives.ca or uh, our phone number is 705-748-6324 uh, and my extension is 206, just in case I don't catch everybody. Um, you, you did answer the wet blade one and I'd like to uh, ask one last question. If you want to connect your my, so this person asks, if I want to connect my project with existing control projects, where can I find out about car control efforts? Who should I talk to? Well, they can talk to me, <laughs> or uh, uh, I, I can help direct them in the, uh, if they like. Um, other than that, uh, conservation authorities are a good place to start as well. They, they uh, a lot of them are very engaged in the Phragmites uh, control efforts in, in their watershed. And that's basically um, what's required is a watershed approach. So uh, that's another area. Maybe the municipality is engaged. Um, certainly where I live, our municipality is very much active in getting it out of the roadside ditches. Um, and so are, the, are so a lot of local local uh, NGOs and cottage associations and other other uh, groups. So um, there, there's a groundswell of work going going on around the, the province now. And, and um, if the person wants specific information in the area they are in, I, I can try and help with that. Yeah, and I would recommend people getting in touch with uh, the Ontario for Humanities Working Group. I think that would be a great yeah. place to start. <laughs> There are a few more, again, uh, there's a few more questions. Do municipalities or other road authorities need a letter of opinion uh, for uh, spraying and drainage ditches when they are dry? No. No. Great. Um, and I think we're going to stop there because it is 1.10, we're 10 minutes over, but those were fantastic questions and great answers. Thank you so much, Janice, and everybody for contributing to that discussion. Uh, uh, and it's wonderful to have you with us um, and uh, wonderful answers. Well, thank you. You did a great job getting the information out. And uh, it's not an easy topic to, to dispel down to 40 minutes. So, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank you so much for that kind thought. If anybody has any, uh, any more questions, please email us or call us. If you uh, don't mind, there will be a survey being sent out about the webinar and the webinar series. Information is valuable. 
anything that you can give us to to make our presentations better and our information um, more useful, let us know. We're all well, uh, welcoming uh, constructive criticism. Everybody have a wonderful day, and uh, we'll see you for the next webinar. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.